It's exciting that this many people are excited about this. Um, I was very pleased to be asked to share some of the work that I do, some of the work that I hope to um, have you all embrace in how you approach your work on a day-to-day -day basis. So good afternoon. I am Wendy Schultz, and I am actually a futurist. I mean, like a card-carrying, have two graduate degrees. Yes, it is an academic discipline in future studies, futurist. So they sort of said, yeah, help people understand how to think about the future and use more foresight in what we do every day. I thought, well, this will be fun. Let's see, 40 years of, you have 20 minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> so so here's um, the first good news. When I'm thinking about, you know, how to explain to people what foresight is, I could take the kind of very theoretical, pointy-headed version that references chaos theory and complexity and say that it is inherently focused on chaos, which I'm sure you all have a lot of experience with. But more importantly, it's focused on how people as complex adaptive systems navigate that and adapt to it and even mitigate it. And the good news is, sorry, I'm having to do this kind of in, in two directions at once so that I can actually see what slides I'm using. The good news is we all do this all the time. Humans are inherently futurists. So I have a quick question for you, and I'd like to see um, a show of hands. When you were planning to come here, whether it was from... Uh, two blocks down the street or the next city over or the next continent over, and you were planning to spend three days here and packing, how many of you checked the weather reports and thought about whether or not you needed to bring an umbrella? See? Now, I don't know how many of you travel a lot, but I travel a lot, and so that's, that's a habit of contingency planning I have, right? It could be sunny for the next three days, but I have my umbrella, so I have a contingency plan. We all do that all the time. You're all thinking about the future and creating contingency plans constantly. Now, the thing is, some of those are sort of the obvious contingencies. And now there are some of you in the audience who are looking at this slide and going, okay, we get the umbrella, what's with the volcano? So there was one meeting I was traveling to and I got there, and it was a, a teamwork project, and uh, we were all sitting there working, and many of us had a sort of news reports up in a separate window in addition to the uh, Word documents we were working on. And all of a sudden, about four of us looked up at the same time and went, oh my word, they've just shut down European airspace. So, you know, I had an umbrella for that trip to Bucharest, but I hadn't actually figured out a contingency plan for Aya Filta Yokult through a lot of uh, volcanic glass into the air and nobody could go anywhere because of this Icelandic volcano. And so then that adapting, mitigating comes in, right? So we all had to get together and go, all right, we're going to have to have different plans on how to get back not flying from Bucharest to wherever we were going. It became an adventure. So we all think about the future all the time, and we're all already planning for it. What I'm here to talk about a little bit is what the formal version of futures thinking and foresight is, what some of the tools are, and what some of the basic rules of thumb are. Very first rule of thumb, you are exploring possibilities you're not predicting. Because of that thing I just said about chaos and complexity, Humans are not a linear system. We cannot predict, but we can explore and we can forecast within ranges of probability. Sorry, I am forgetting to do this. Okay. Ambidexterity, very important in the future. Okay. Secondly, and this is a bit tricky for those of us who are academics, there are no future facts. Maybe at some point in the future, I will be able to time travel into you know 20 years from now and actually do sociological observations of what's going on, but right now, not possible. So I can't collect facts about the future, but I can collect facts about change, and I can collect facts 
about the images of the future that all of you have in your imaginations and in your minds and in your assumptions. Because we act to some extent based on our images of the future. They do affect our behavior, whether it's an image of the future of what we want for lunch or uh, what we think the weekend is going to bring us in terms of weather and how we're planning for that or our long range hopes and goals for our work with the Center for Humanitarian Data. So we can collect people's stories about what they think the future will be. The other trick to future studies is that while I say I don't make predictions, the one prediction I will make is that tomorrow in the larger sense of that word will be nothing like today. So the operating assumptions you have in your head right now about how things work those assumptions will be less and less fit for purpose as time goes on because of this turbulent environment of change that we all lived in. So we have to get used to upending our assumptions. And I'm sure you've all by now figured out what's wrong with the picture behind me. The other trick is that we also have to be fairly self-critical about those assumptions and our biases and our perspectives. And in my discipline, as well as a lot of other disciplines, one of the things that we are paying a lot of attention to now is the idea of decolonizing, not just politically, but decolonizing socially and mentally, right? Be aware of the lenses I have based on my, soci my socialization and how that is different from the lenses other people from different professional cultures or geographic cultures might have. Bear in mind that an actually interesting way to generate new insights, innovation, and creativity is to change lenses. So it's one of the reasons why we encourage as much inclusiveness and participation as we can in futures work, because your thinking about the future will be better, your blind spots will be fewer, the more diversity you bring into the room the more diversity you bring into the conversations, whether of um, multidisciplinary perspectives or, again, geographic and cultural perspectives. So humans innately think about the future. In terms of formal thinking about the future, that also has been going on for a very, very long time. And yes, I know you cannot read <laughs> the fine details of this, although I'm happy to share this map with you, a very talented graphic artist put it together for um, myself and some colleagues. But basically, you can trace thinking back uh, to the future all the way back to um, sort of uh, historians in ancient China and um, in Arabic culture to Ibn Khaldun and analysis of big historical and cultural shifts. Moving forward, you have some of the work done in looking at how um, to pl centrally plan economies of entire nations, uh, looking at how to respond to um, the depression, the global depression, uh, quartermastering the various world wars. That's a bit of a dark view of the futures, but a lot of interesting, um, theoretically interesting systemic work came out of that in terms of operations research. But you can bring this all the way forward to governments, NGOs, and private sector companies all over the world are investing heavily in building their foresight capacity. And two weeks ago, I was with the World Organization of Animal Health, and we spent an entire day kind of immersing something like 1,200 people in three different possible scenarios of the future so they could think about what demands they would have to respond to potentially, again, contingency planning, a sort of big global version of, is it going to rain or is it going to be sunny? Are we going to see an entire collapse of the global food chain due to the climate crisis? Or, you know, will there be better outcomes that we can work with? So a lot of examples of foresight all over the world. I am happy, come find me. I am happy to share examples, share materials, give you people to talk to, give you bibliographies, so happy. So what is it we do formally? Five key things. If you do nothing else, if you're doing these five key things, you're ramping up your foresight capacity. Increase your awareness of the change that's going on around you. 
And I know everybody is busy and everyone has more sort of fires to put out on their desktop than you have time for. But, you know, give it a half an hour a week to just really think, what have I read recently or seen recently or who have I talked to recently who's told me something that is new, that is different, that is novel, that's uh, a new behavior pattern, a new um, business paradigm, um, a prototype uh, a prototype invention, um, a potential new policy that seems like a really novel and interesting approach, maybe some community project that is doing something really different on the ground locally with people that matters and that is taking a really new approach. What are the things that are changing around me, either in my field or external to my field that might have an impact on me? So awareness of change. Then the next question is, well, great. <laughs> I now have a wonderful collection of things to talk about at parties. Why do we care that things are changing? Because they have an impact. So the next question is, what will those impacts be? Who will experience them the most? Who will pay the most costs? Who will benefit the most? How does it change power differentials or economic differentials? How does it change environmental quality? So critiquing the impacts of change. If you do that often enough, you're beginning to sort of forecast what sort of futures those changes could uh, push us towards. And that leads us to the third item that I think is possibly what futurists are best known for, which is imagining those possible scenarios. The sunny day, the rainy day, it was actually snowing in Scotland two days ago, <laughs> you know, whatever you're facing. Um, so what are the alternate possible futures? Because one thing that is an assumption of future studies is that there is no such thing as the future. From this moment, and this moment, and this moment, and this moment, the present, the present, the present, there are multiple pathways into the future, depending upon the actions we all take or don't take. Then the other question we have to ask is, well, if those are the possibilities, so those are thought experiments, right? What do we want? What are the kinds of, of ideas about the future that get us so excited and get other people so excited that we start banding together and saying, we could actually work to create this and it would be better. It would be better than what we've got today. Even if only better in a small way, that's a start. So the fourth key activity in futures is um, visioning preferred futures. And the fifth, of course, is the hard part. Or what my, my partner in business says, you know, she, she listens to me do these, these presentations on the future and change and, and facilitate workshops and we all have a great time and people laugh and say the future is gonna be amazing and weird and strange. And, and then they get to her and she goes, so I'm here to talk to you about how we create change. She did the fun part, I'm bringing the pain, because change hurts, and it's hard work, right? But all of, the, all of the previous work and analysis that I've talked about in futures doesn't mean anything until we, unless we actually start acting differently, until we act to create change. Okay, systems, chaos, and adaptation. Ooh, I have like maybe five minutes. This is gonna be interesting. All right. Right, so one of my favorite quotes is, we are hanging between the no longer and the not yet, and thus we are necessarily unstable. The great thing about chaos and turbulence is that it's this kind of vibrant open space where more things become possible and you can create new things. There are a lot of downsides to it as well, but you know, balance your pessimism with a little optimism about agency. All right. So if we're talking about futures, we're talking about time and change. That, that really is what I spend most of my, my work doing. And the thing about change is that it's not a neat line. I mentioned this earlier. We are not a ballistics problem. Humans are uh, more complicated than that. Um, we tend to create systems, we exist within environmental systems, we exist within built environment systems, and those systems are evolving and they're messy. So we're constantly having to, if we want to do this well, 
we can't do straight line extrapolations. We can explore different outcomes, and you can do that quantitatively, but you always have to ask the question, what will be the impacts? How do people perceive this? How do they think about it? And these days, a phrase that more and more people are becoming aware of with the climate crisis is the idea of tipping points. The, the interesting uh, dynamic of complex systems, especially in chaotic environments, is that they can be sort of burbling along, looking like they're doing pretty well and being stable, and a small change can create a tipping point, and all of a sudden the entire system can cascade into a completely different situation. Sorry. Okay, this is harder than I thought, this coordination. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a new skill right in front of you. I, it's interesting. All right, so tipping points. Uh, and if you haven't been paying attention to the various bits of data coming from the climate crisis, which I'm sure this room has, but you know, the people I was talking to yesterday, some of this stuff was new to them, um, you should be because we are rapidly approaching several potentially catastrophic tipping points in terms of environmental systems. So that concept of activity one, heightening your awareness of change because all those changes are not happening neatly one by one, so we can handle them one by one, they're all happening at the same time. And what that means is they're generating a very turbulent, chaotic environment, lucky us, and so the constant challenge is how do we adapt? And one of the best ways to do that is this kind of contingency thinking that I'm talking about. And here's the fun part. The contingency thinking in many ways is to try and help you surprise yourself as a thought experiment before history comes along and surprises you for real, right? Me and that volcano, that was a surprise. I can't quite imagine the contingency experiment that would have made me think, yeah, and what if a volcano explodes in Iceland and shuts down airspace, but still. So um, one of the senior thinkers in Futures who founded the field, and who was also my dissertation chair, um, is famous for saying, any useful idea about the future should appear to be ridiculous. Because if I tell you something about change and you go, oh, yes, of course, I, I see that, I know that, well, then you're probably already planning for it, I, I would hope. If I tell you something that appears so astonishing that you laugh out loud, I'm doing my job right and I've made you think about something that is outside of your current assumptions and starting to challenge those assumptions. But the trick is being useful in doing that. So that's what the various futures techniques and methods are meant to help us with, being more useful. And I'm going to talk about three things. Ooh, doing pretty good. I'm going to talk about three techniques that we are actually using throughout the next two and a half, two and a half days. And I'm kind of the, um, the human embodiment of continuity for the futures thread in activities for the next three days. I know you have a lot of really interesting breakout sessions. Trust me, I wish I could go to some of them. I hope they're being recorded. Um, but there are three particular tools that we're also gonna be using um, throughout the three days, and we have breakout sessions devoted to them. So this afternoon, there will be a breakout session on the future, shared drivers, um, strategic drivers, and tomorrow there will be a breakout session where we're talking about sort of the present and emerging changes that we see in the present and our assumptions in the present. And then Friday, some of those transition, okay, we'll buckle down and accept the pain and create change. How are we gonna do that, right? So the first thing we're gonna ask you to do, and you'll note um, how to describe where this is. So right outside this room, there's a coffee bar. Some of you may have already gotten some coffee there. And right across from the coffee bar, there's sort of a flat wooden uh, platform that I suppose is seating. And on it, we have a giant graphic of a shared history timeline. And we are asking you to contribute to that during your coffee breaks as you're chatting with people. So ask yourself, 
if you think back 70 years, what was different? What's changed? How was 1950 different from today? And that can be any aspect, right? So 1950, 1960, 1970, we've got all the decades. You can choose a favorite decade. What stories, events, behaviors, facts, fashions, cultural icons, who won the Emmy? Who won the Oscar, right? Uh, policies, leaders, value shifts, and other watersheds. Can you think, can you remember, or Google, <laughs> um, to add to that timeline? We'd love to have that timeline absolutely packed with your thoughts and perceptions on things. And part of the reason we're doing this is because, quite frankly, I want to remind you that we have all lived through massive transformative change. Some of us have lived through many more decades of massive transformative change than others in this room, but I'm, I'm hoping that that sets up the pattern of, yeah, and it's not like change is going to stop because we're all grown-ups now. It's the massive transformative change is continuing forward into the future. But let's see if we can just map our mental landscape of change for the past 50 years. Then... We're going to talk this afternoon about drivers and trends of change. And futurists use a tool um, called the S curve of change or the life cycle of emerging change. And um, has anyone in here done any work on epidemiological data? Pandemic data? Epidemic data? Okay, so you know that epi epidemiologists look for what they call patient zero, right? The first instance in a society of a disease occurring. And in futures, we're kind of doing the same thing. Where was that first novel idea thought up? You know, what lab or what garage did someone come up with an invention? Um, what was the coffee table conference? Um, what young kid came up with the idea of doing raves, right? Um, where did, where did some of the fashions erupt from? Uh, where did some of our new approaches and new paradigms about scraping data and presenting it and visualizing it? Who, who, came, who came up with some of those? So we look for, we try and find as close as we can to the emerging point of a change because the sooner you spot a change that might have a big impact, the more time you have to address it, either to take, uh, take it as an opportunity and make use of it, or if it has negative outcomes, it's a change you maybe want to ameliorate or control or regulate, then you have time to do that as well. So we try and spot change early. It goes back to that activity one, heightening our awareness of change. So this afternoon in the breakout session on drivers of change, we're going to be talking about some of the changes that... Um, the Center for Humanitarian Data staff have been identifying, and we're going to prioritize them. And then the sort of overarching theme of all of these days is basically um, something called the Three Horizons Framework, which deals with waves of change. And if I think of it as a timeline, I could say, well, it's, it's talking about near-term change, far change, and kind of the midterm change in the middle, which is the space where we can act. What's important is that it is also three mindsets. Bill Sharp, who uh, came up with this framework, said, you know, one of the interesting things from his perspective is that first horizon is all about the current assumptions and the current state of play. And the managerial mindset is about keeping that stable. And we need that. That's a good thing. Sometimes he calls that the stewardship mindset. But the problem is with keeping things stable and adhering to the assumptions that you currently have that are based on your past experience, because so they, they seem to work well, is that because the context is dynamic, those changes will become less fit for purpose over time. At the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, the third horizon, where you have all the those emerging changes and the really visionary uh, transformative, paradigm-busting ideas, you have people who are thinking wild creative thoughts, but they may not be very pragmatic. So they may, they may not be very usable wild creative thoughts. 
in the middle, kind of standing between what was and what could be, you have the entrepreneurial mindset, which says, let's respect what we've learned from the past, but look at the opportunities emerging in these new paradigms and new perspectives and build something new. That works. And that works for as many people as possible. So, <laughs> I thought I was doing well, but okay. All right, so one other thing that's important about in, in futures is this idea of multiple possible futures, all the futures. And uh, ooh, and we thought we had changed this, and I guess it didn't take. So first of all, I apologize for the old English wording of this. This is old like Oxford culture, or has it been changed? Oh, good. Sorry, there's an original version of this quote that we decided needed translating and updating into a more colloquial English. Um, the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. So again, future studies is about my trying to help you to get better at imagining the strange. And that includes three different kinds of futures. The, the set of everything that's possible. So that's like the infinite set of all possible imaginable futures, whether they're um, credible, whether they're pragmatic, whether they're physically uh, possible or not. The smaller set of futures that are more probable because we can actually see the changes leading up to them. They do um, comply with the known laws of physics, things like that. So probable futures. And we can, uh, we can sort of evaluate their probability by monitoring the growth of change and trends. And then the futures we prefer, what we desire. And the only way we can really judge those, because each one of those is going to be very sub subjective, is to have conversations where we share our values, right? So that requires dialogue. Um, to articulate preferred futures, we engage in visioning visioning for preferred futures. We explore uncertain possible futures by building scenarios. And we forecast trends and their outcomes so we can plan in real world terms for more probable futures. Deep, sorry. So the objective of future studies is to take those preferred futures that may be possible but aren't probable and make them more probable. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, so the shorthand for that uh, from my colleague Clem Beasold is scenarios are thought experiments. So they are futures for the head. Visions are statements of values and cherished beliefs, and they are futures for the heart, and they inspire change. Okay, why now, why here? I actually, this is the last few slides, yay kind of to time, oh well. Um, <laughs> some of you may have noticed that I'm wearing two buttons on my lapel, I know. It's a big stretch for the folks in the back. The top one is a rainbow circle. That of course is the sustainable development goals icon. Below that is a kind of scribbled sketch that is the icon for the Center for Post-Normal Policy and Future Studies. So catch me over coffee and ask me what post-normal times are. Uh, spoiler alert, you're in them. Um, characterized by context and work in which facts are uncertain, values are in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions are urgent. Raise your hand if that thinks, if you think that applies to everything that you personally are doing in humanitarian work, right? So. Okay, why are we doing this now? So I'm just gonna echo back what Sarah started off with. Um, the rationale for doing this sort of set of futures conversations and exercises for the next two and a half days is to think about how the systems in which you're embedded and the systems um, that you are responsible for collecting data on are um, changing. And that includes both the internal changes that you are making because you are all people with agency and the external changes that are coming in at you to which you have to respond. And we're doing that via some of these collaborative futures methodologies because there are fewer blind spots when we all work together. 
to spot change. And more importantly, there are fewer people left behind when we all work together to envision the futures that we want. Thank you.